Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to this East West Railway Company online public event for Bedford. My name is Claire Keith Anderson and I am the Community Engagement Manager here at East West Railway Company. Following the launch of the second round of non-statutory consultation on the 31st of March, this week we're holding the first online events to run you through what we are consulting on in your area in more detail and address any initial questions you may have about our options and proposals. We are holding similar sessions across the whole route between Oxford and Cambridge throughout this week. We'll start this session with a presentation that will run for about 30 minutes, followed by a 25 to 30 minute question and answer session before we wrap up with some next steps, which should be done by the hour. During the question and answer session, if we have lots of questions about the same thing, we will theme them and answer them this way. We hope to answer all questions, but if we do not have time to, please post your questions with your email address in the chat bar and we will get back to you. Many thanks. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to the rest of the team. Joining us today, we also have our Strategy Director, Will Gallagher, our Delivery Director for CS2, John Hillman, our Director of Construction, John Worthington, our Head of Environmental Impact, Michael Shanks, our Head of Operations, Maria Cliff, Head of Development Partner, Paul Sparrow. Our Land and Property Manager, Jorn Pace. Our Development Manager, Stephen Barker. And Martin Wheeler, DCO Director at Ardent, our Land Specialists. We also have Tom and Hannah behind the scenes helping us. Before we start the presentation, I'm going to run through a brief housekeeping and Teams Live note. Many of you might be familiar with Teams Live, but just as a reminder, you'll be on mute throughout. You'll find in the bar below the Q&A feature where my colleague has just posted a message. Please use this feature to ask questions. You can send questions through at any time during the presentation although we hope the slides already address some of your inquiries. In the Q&A section, we will aim to address the questions you've got so far on the consultation. Any questions that we're not able to address or answer during the session will take away and follow up via email afterwards. Please note that we are recording these sessions and therefore will not reference any names or descriptions directly, even if provided in the question for GDR, GDPR reasons. That's all the housekeeping we have. Over to you now, Will. Uh, th thanks very much, Claire, and um, I'm glad uh, so many people can join us uh, this afternoon. So if we if we flick onto the next slide, um, we have launched a uh, non-statutory public consultation on the 31st of March and over the and that will run or is running for the next uh, 10 weeks through to the 9th of June. And in today's briefing, uh, as you can see on the slide, we'll give you a brief introduction uh, to the consultation overall, what we're consulting on. So we've got our team of experts here who will be able to walk you through uh, the detail of what we're consulting on, um, you know, uh, sort of live as it were. There'll be an opportunity to ask, as Claire said, some questions on that um, before uh, sort of reflecting on how people can get involved and, and the next steps that flow from here. So in terms of what we're consulting on, as I say, it is a 10 week consultation and it covers a range of things. It covers all the infrastructure interventions that we need to make um, from Oxford through to Cambridge to be able to run that full um, Oxford Cambridge 
uh, service. And that does mean interventions as geographically diverse as Oxford, Oxford Parkway Station, the London Road level crossing at Bicester, through to enhancements on the Marston Vale line at Bedford Station as well, and then heading further east across um, through the uh, East Coast Main Line, and then on to uh, Camborne and into Cambridge uh, Station itself. So you know the full suite of infrastructure interventions, but we were really clear that this project isn't just about um, where we where we lay the tracks um, and you know, the infrastructure that we're building, but we are here to deliver a railway service, and it really matters to us that even at this early stage, while we're still developing the infrastructure itself, we do have that customer experience really front of mind in terms of um, you know, what, what local residents, what members of the public want from the railway that is, that is being uh, developed. So um, we will over the course of the next sort of 25 to 30 minutes, sort of walk through those in a bit more uh, detail. If we flick onto the next slide, um, this just gives you an idea, you know, based upon that geography, you know, of the consultation zone. So the the areas that we are, uh, you know, where where the consultation is is live, um, and also where over the last few days people will have been sort of receiving through their letterboxes the summary documents of our consultation. So that just gives you an idea of the geographic spread um, of the consultation that we're currently engaged in. If we move on to the next slide, and you can see as we break that down, not just into the consultation zone, but in terms of the actual infrastructure interventions, um, we have, as I've noted, infrastructure interventions at the Oxford end, along the Marston Vale line, at and through Bedford, and the set of route alignment options um, in the in the mustard box there um, before then settling into the approach into Cambridge and our proposals uh, there too. So that gives you an idea of the spread of the geography. And I think today we're going to be particularly focused um, with this group um, on the um, on those interventions in the red box, um, but also as I've said before, not forgetting this isn't just about infrastructure, but this is about the train services that we are here to offer and the experience that we're here to deliver. And so on that basis, as we flick over to the next slide, I will hand over to Maria, who will be able to talk you through the, uh, the detailed content on the customer experience consultation. Thank you, Will, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria Cliff. I am head of operations for East West, East West Railway Company um, and I really just want to give you a brief overview of why it's really important to us that we ask you, our future customers of this railway, about what you want from it in terms of the customer experience that we, we can offer to you and, and aim to deliver. Um, so East West Railway Company at the moment is acting as a shadow operator. That means that we are carrying out all of the activities uh, in relation to railway operations that a train operating company uh, would usually be responsible for. That includes um, various elements uh, from what the timetable should be and how it can how it can fit in with existing services to create better connectivity um, east-west and north-south um, and and the, the elements of the customer experience and railway operations consultation are route wide all the way from Oxford to Cambridge. So we're really keen to hear your views. Um, and we've asked various questions in this section of the consultation document so that we can understand each aspect um, of your journey and what you want from it. So for us, it's not just about the station's experience and being on the train. As I said, it's how you get to your station, having a regular service uh, that meets your needs. Um, along with the information that we provide to you, every every um, element of that journey, uh, including post journey, and and the interactions that you want with the colleagues that will be working on East West Rail. So, where do you want to see staff? How do you want those interactions to 
to enhance your customer experience. Um, so please, we encourage you to please take the time to, to respond to this, um, this area of the consultation. Um, and we absolutely look forward to hearing your views so that I and my team and the rest of the team can include your feedback in our in our next steps in our in our decision making. So thank you very much for your time. I'll uh, I'll hand over to John Hiltman. Thanks, Maria. So good afternoon to you all. My name's John Hillman. I'm the CS2 Delivery Director for East West Rail Company. I want to talk to you a little bit about Bedford uh, and the approaches both north and south. Um, OK, so Bedford itself, we recognise clearly is, a, is an integrated part of the rail industry network. It's an important transport hub, both, both for, um, for railways, but equally for people seeking to make journeys elsewhere. In introducing East West Rail, we recognise that actually Bedford Station is unable to accommodate the services and the capacity that East West Rail requires. And therefore we're going to, well, we're proposing to make some infrastructure changes at Bedford that would allow East West Rail to operate. Uh, and equally, it's important when we consider the infrastructure we provide that we recognise, as Will outlined earlier, that actually this service is, is about Oxford to Cambridge. So it's important that we provide infrastructure at Bedford that allows a reliable service to operate all the way across that route and it doesn't become a bottleneck for East West Rail and equally doesn't become a point that impacts a performance across the rest of the rail industry um, as, as the East West Rail service goes across from east to west. So we also recognise that, that Bedford is, is already used by a lot of people. It's important to people's journeys currently and, and their lifestyle, but equally it's, we recognise that going forward, it's about jobs, prosperity and including growth for, for Bedford itself as well. And if people are interested in the Bedford section, just, just for confirmation, it's in section C of the consultation document in case you want to find it if you've not already done so. Next slide, please. So in and around Bedford and on the approaches, this slide summarises what we're looking at. In the south, we'll be looking to make some interventions at Bedford St John's and I'll run through those in a bit more detail. And I'll also talk about Bedford Station and, and what we're looking at and proposing currently, and then also look to north of Bedford and the route out of Bedford uh, Station to the north. So Bedford St John's is a single platform. It's on a relatively short piece of railway uh, or straight piece of railway, I should say, with, with extreme curvature at either end. And that means that actually the speed through that section is, is restricted to around about 15 miles an hour. And therefore, in order to create the service and the ability and the capacity for East West Rail to operate between Oxford and Cambridge, we need to provide two tracks through that area but equally we need to raise the speed to at least a minimum of 30 miles an hour, otherwise the journey, the journey impacts on time would be, would be significant. So we are looking at moving St John's Station uh, and the next slide will, will give us one of the options and I'll run through both of these options. So the option one is to replace the station. The current location is the red, uh, the railway symbol there, the red background um, shows where Bedford St John's currently is and the blue light blue uh, lozenge next to it is the area or somewhere in that area that we would be likely to relocate the station under this option. It would mean that it would it would run um, we would have to rebuild Cordwell Street Bridge because uh, it isn't sufficiently high for our trains to pass underneath um, but we would continue to use existing bridge over the River Great Ouse, so we wouldn't have to provide a new bridge uh, and it, the station would be located in an area that's relatively close to where it is today. On the next slide, please. Option two is slightly different in that in order to get a faster line speed and a straighter railway, you can see the existing Bedford St John station with the, the red background on the railway sign. And because we haven't got a relatively straight piece of railway in this configuration, we would have to move the station to a position that's slightly south of where it currently is. And that's the, the purple lozenge 
with the Bedford St John station box there next to it, which is in a completely different uh, area to where it is today. What it would mean is again, as in option one, we would need to rebuild the Cornwall Street Bridge, uh, but we would also have to provide a new crossing of the uh, the river in order to come in to towards Bedford on a slightly different alignment. And so that's um, Bedford St John's location that we're proposing in this would be close close to the Ampt Hill Road and the El Elstor Road pedestrian link bridge. So to give you an idea uh, where where we're talking about in that area. Next slide, please. So Bedford Station area itself, uh, Bedford Station being the again the the red circle there with the with the railway sign in the middle of it. Um, what this shows is the blue um, colouring is the area that we are discussing and and evaluating options for. As you can see, it runs from close to Bedford St John's at the bottom there over the river, past the sidings and through the station area and then back out, back out through to uh, to the north. The purple or light mauve area is is the area that we're currently looking at for a station location and its amenities. So in order to provide capacity and space for East West Rail to get trains through to go forward to Cambridge, we need to provide more platforms at Bedford Station. And that would mean that the current ticket hall area would have to be moved and that would provide area for the platforms. We would therefore seek to reprovision the ticket hall and the customer facilities and the car parking somewhere in and around that that light purple um, box that we've shown there. We don't know exactly where they will go at the moment. It is it is just part of the area work that we're doing uh, and we will develop those options going forward in order to actually bring proper options to the statutory consultation. We do recognise that that obviously, as it says there, in that in that purple area we've identified that there may be some impacts on some properties but as i said we haven't developed the options or the designs yet that would tell us exactly what that impact may be next slide please so the current the current station at bedford um, in effect we need to provide more platforms on the east side of the station uh, as a result of the 15 mile an hour speed limit from bedford st john's uh, we've got quite a restricted approach and therefore we're seeking to bring the trains into Bedford in a completely different way. We can't use the current platform because it's a bay platform uh, and there's insufficient space and capacity to come through the existing station towards the north. Next slide please. So in order to deliver these benefits we would be and, and the picture there shows platform 1A where the current services for the Marston Vales line come into Bedford we would be looking to turn that into a through platform and then to build some additional platforms to the right of that as you look at it today and then relocate the uh, customer facilities um, and possibly some of the car parking arrangements slightly to the north. Next slide. So moving on from Bedford itself, uh, moving out from Bedford towards the north, um, this slide shows the alignment for East West Rail. Um, it comes out of, out of Bedford, as I said, runs adjacent to the current Midland Main Line before it in effect turns right and heads off towards Cambridge. Um, as you can see there, the alignment shows roughly where the, where the railway is expected to, uh, to go. It would mean two additional tracks um, to the to the east of the current railway. Um, and as we've referred to in the documentation in the consultation, um, there could be some impacts on uh, properties along that along that section of line. And then at the top, as you'll see, the A6 of Great Ouse Way is would be diverted to run over the new railway. Uh, and then we would propose to build a viaduct over the over the River Great Ouse and the A6 Paula Radcliffe uh, way as we head out towards Cambridge. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to pass over to uh, 
to Jorn to do uh, to talk about landowners and property. Thanks, Jorn. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jorn Pace. Um, I'm the land property manager for East West Rail. I'm part of the land property team. Um, we also have some other members from the land team on this call um, to, to help answer any questions you may have. So one of the key roles of the land and property team is to consult with landowners who could be potentially directly affected by the scheme and to keep them updated on the proposals as they develop from this early stage. Inevitably, with a, with a project of this size, um, these proposals do require additional land outside the existing railway boundary. And as part of our DCO application, which is likely to be sometime between 2022 and 2024, um, we'll be seeking powers for compulsory purchase. Compulsory purchase um, would, however, be our last resort after other means of attempting to reach an agreement with a landowner. And I'm keen to point out that the land requirements um, are not finalised and they'll be refined as the design evolves. Prior to the launch of our consultation, um, we wrote to landowners who could be potentially physically affected by the land search areas and, and to inform them of our proposals. And this encouraged landowners to get in contact with our specialist land team to give them further information about the proposals and to discuss the project timeline and answer any questions you may have. And with speaking with, with, with landowners um, and gaining feedback, it also helps us understand the land use and how we can um, keep our negative impact as minimal as possible. So on schemes such as these, um, at, at the point of DCO submission, um, those landowners who, would, um, who own properties within the line of the proposed railway route uh, and who are unable to sell their property um, at market value um, are, are affected by what's known as statutory blight. And they'd be able to submit a statutory blight notice asking for us to buy their property. We recognise though that this is later in the programme, which is why we're consulting on a discretionary purchase scheme, the need to sell scheme. And in, if introduced, this would provide support to those who have a pressing need to sell and it would be introduced at the preferred route or option selection point at statutory consultation. The other key difference being is that the need to sell scheme wouldn't be limited to land within the, the, the line of the railway. So we're looking for feedback on what people think about this and if it's the right mitigation. There's further information on our website uh, where there's a section focused on land and property. Uh, and this contains a, a number of guides um, such as the need to sell scheme, uh, blight, um, compulsory purchase and compensation. There are feedback forms um, which are encouraging people to return back um, and further details on how to get in contact with us. We have a dedicated team who can talk to landowners about their concerns and answer any questions they may have. I'll now pass back to Claire um, who will discuss the consultation further. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you very much for coming along, everyone, today. We are sorry that we can't be with you in person, but unfortunately that's out of our hands, but we really appreciate you um, joining us this afternoon. So today's session is all about running you through the elements we'll be consulting on that are relevant to you. And then in May, we've got a, another session for the Bedford area. It's going to be a more discursive session and it will talk about key themes such as the benefits of the railway, environmental impact, the impact of construction. And the idea is you'll have a chance to read through all the documents and then you'll come back raised with more questions or any questions you might have. So all of you who live within the consultation zone will have received a summary of the consultation document by now. On our website, you will have seen there's lots and lots of information for you to read and you can get hard copies of this information if that's what you would like. So please do order hard copies. They take about um, 48 hours to come to you. Um, so we have our consultation document and our technical report for you to read, the consultation summary document. We also have a community hub and resource centre and if you haven't already, please visit our virtual consultation rooms. Um, there is one for each geographic section of the uh, route. 
and we have community events as we are have today but also we have live chat events and we had the first live chat event yesterday the live chat um, function is found in our consultation room and if you can't come to a live chat you can still leave your question in the live chat function and we will get back to you so there are lots of different ways we really want you to get involved we really want to hear from you um, so we because of feedback from many residents in Bedford we've actually been able to um, change the timing of the next Bedford seminar webinar on the 12th of May it was from 11 to 12 p.m but it's now from 7 to 8 p.m so we, we really are pleased to listen to your feedback and where we are able to will um, take account of that so I mentioned our events, our live chat events. There are a series of, um, it says here 12, but actually there's 10 to our live chat events. So just go to our website and you'll see all the different events listed there. And then for those people who aren't online who, or who don't feel comfortable in an online setting, we have a dedicated phone line. So we'd like to hear from you if you um, don't wish to engage with us through a virtual medium. Next slide, please. So it's come to the part of our um, webinar where I'd like to um, ask Tom, because I believe he's hosting our questions and answers session. Thank you. Hi. Um, Oh, is that Alice? Alice? Yeah, it's Alison. Oh, you don't sound like Tom. Probably it's okay. Alison. <laughs> I'll hand um, over to Alison. Okay. Uh, we've had quite a lot of questions that have come through on the chat, so we'll try and get through these um, in the time we've got left. Um, try and cut them down by themes. Um, starting with uh, quite a few questions on Route E, um, in particular. Um, why it's been chosen as it was previously thought it was the most expensive um, and due to its environmental impact. So you could answer that please. I'm just trying to take myself off mute. Uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll jump in on this one and then I'll um, I'll revert to uh, Paul, who can provide probably a little bit more of the sort of technical uh, information. So we obviously consult, we developed five root option areas um, that were listed A through to E. We uh, sort of developed those up and we put those out to public consultation. Um, we received quite a lot of feedback as part of that public consultation. Um, and we applied a set of 15 assessment factors to those routes that looked at things from capital cost to environmental impact, to the way they support the development of housing, uh, to transport user benefits in terms of journey times and those sorts of things. So a full suite of assessment factors that were set out in all the documentation at the time and when you come when you look at those assessment factors in the round informed as well by the consultation that had taken place um, we set out in uh, January of 2020 uh, that route E was our preferred option area um, and it has been in the vicinity of route E that we have subsequently been developing our alignments um, so the way Ruti was selected was on the back of a series of you know, the, the, the work that we'd done on, you know, on those root option areas and applying those 15 assessment factors. Um, and that, you know, uh, that, that remains the case. As we've said before, you know, all of these uh, decisions are about expressing preferences and should uh, new information come to light, um, that leads us to revisit those then we're absolutely open to doing that and that's why we have a sort of process of back checking which means we validate the decisions uh, that we are 
uh, that we're taking all the way through to the point of uh, submitting our application for development consent. So I, I sort of hope that sort of sets out um, you know, the approach that we took. Um, Paul, I don't know whether there's anything sort of specific on Route E that you want to you want to call out at this point. Um, nothing specific, I think, in uh, more than what you've uh, spoken about. Um, and the key points are to do with the economic benefits and the differences between the, the environmental benefits of, of Route E. Um, Whilst we appreciate that a new railway across anywhere is going to have an impact, it's about that level of impact and the ability to avoid, and that's what Ruti gave us the opportunity to be able to do. That, 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 that's great. Thank, thanks, Paul. I'll hand back over now to Alison to sort of pick up the next question. Alison, have we have we lost you or? Sorry, um, there's some questions around freight. Um, will there be freight and in particular, how, how much freight traffic will there be? How many trains per day approximately? I think John's okay. going to pick this yeah, up. Yeah, I, I, can, I can take that one. So, so around freight, um, on the Marston Val line, there is there is currently freight. Um, in actual fact, there's five, what we call five freight paths a day. In other words, there's availability for five freight trains a day in each direction um, within the current capacity. The fact that that probably one or maybe two a day are, are used is just the fact the way that freight works with it being predominantly open access and based on demand rather than in the same way that passenger services run um, on, a, on a predetermined timetable. So for the Marston Vale section uh, and through Bedford and access onto the Marston Vale section, we will be maintaining that freight traffic. In respect of, of north of Bedford heading out towards Cambridge, it's a brand new railway. It will be built as what we call a, a mixed traffic railway. In other words, it will be capable of taking freight, but that freight capability will be part of the uh, capacity that exists on the railway. So if we are putting four fast passenger trains an hour onto the railway, then the capacity in between those passenger trains will be what exists. So we are not doing anything to specifically drive freight uh, to use the route. Uh, by increasing or providing freight loops or anything specific to freight. But if capacity exists, then freight operators would naturally be able to use it, as is the requirement for a, a, a railway in the UK um, currently. Thanks. OK, thank you. Um, does anyone else want to add to that? OK, we'll move on then. Um, it's questions around Bedford Station. There's been some concerns about commuter traffic around Bedford Station already being um, busy and the impact that a new station would have on that. Um, John, are you, would you be able to answer that? I can take that. Um, okay. okay, so so the, the proposals around Bedford Station are, are a very, very early stage at the moment, as you can gather from from, from what we've what we've published. We haven't provided designs because we haven't actually done the work yet to understand exactly what the options look like. We are in the process of engaging with all the parties, including the local authority, including Network Rail, including the operators and others around what those requirements will be. Because it is an existing station, those, those existing users will, will clearly have a very clear view on what they require. And it will be for us to work with them to ensure that we facilitate what we're asking for from East West Rail, but equally what the current operators and network rail would want to see. We're also working with the local authority to understand how we can improve the environment and the place um, and, and co connectivity to the to the town from the station. So that is all featuring in the conversations that we're currently taking as well. And I did uh, I did see a comment about construction. We are 
we are working currently at the moment on a construction strategy. So as part of the next stages, as we get to what are the options, there will be a construction strategy that lays out how we will deal with noise, dust and all the other things that, that come from a construction site. Equally, as part of the development of the station proposals, we will be looking at, at highways modelling, at traffic modelling. We'll also be looking at first mile, last mile, so sustainable transport options. It isn't always all about the car. You know, how do we get more people onto public transport? How do we encourage people to use alternatives to the car? And what we can do in that space in conjunction with partners to get to a, a more sustainable approach at Bedford Station. Thanks, John. Um, another question um, in relation to that. Um, so if, in 2010, Network Rail produced plans for a similar rebuild of Bedford Station that didn't require demolitions of non-railway property. Why are you not working on a similar basis? OK, so, so I, I don't know the detail of Network Rail's 2010 plans, but I would imagine it didn't include um, additional platforms at the east side of the station, which is what we require in order to run East West Rail through there. Uh, but we'll certainly have a look and we'll find those out and, and, and have a look at what was included. But if people have got comments like that, then absolutely get those thoughts into the consultation so we've got a chance to consider them. But we'll take that away and we'll, we'll have a look. Thanks, John. Um, questions in relation to um, passenger service. Are you able to provide more um, details on the passenger service or when is this likely to provide to be provided? Um, and also, um, do you have any information related to journey times and costs from um, Bedford to Cambridge? Probably best for Maria or John to pick up the detail on uh, passenger services and then uh, week and, and journey times um, and then potentially Paul on cost. John, I'll, I'll take I'll take the passenger services. You can take the journey times if that's OK. Um, so we're introducing the railway. We plan to introduce the railway in three stages. Uh, so connection stage one will be two trains per hour in both directions between Oxford and Milton Keynes. Um, our connection stage two will see an additional two passenger services um, per hour between Oxford and Bedford. Um, and then our connection stage three, when we operate the railway through to Cambridge, we'll see an extension of those two trains per hour between Oxford and Bedford through to Cambridge, plus an additional two trains between Bletchley. And Cambridge. So I hope that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you. And um, is there anything else anyone would like to add to that? So I, I was just going to add that the 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 proposed journey times are included within the within the consultation documents. Um, and I'll have a quick look in and find them out for Bedford to Cambridge and, and to Oxford. So give me a second. OK, thank you. Um, while we're waiting for that, um, there's been another question on um, electrification. Why why is it no longer electric? Um, who's the best person to answer that, please? So while, whilst John is having a look at journey times, let me pick up the uh, comment on electrification. So we are um you know the decision on electrification hasn't yet been made um so we are working with government uh, to reach the right conclusion I mean, we've been clear that it's our ambition to be a net zero carbon railway um and therefore we're obviously looking for uh, the 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 lowest carbon um sort of traction that we can uh, we can get and so consequently, you know, there are a number of ways of doing that and technology is moving pretty quickly at the moment. And so for that reason, we are looking at that sort of full set of options. So that might be full overhead line electrification, um, which is, I think, what most people mean by electrification. Um, that does come at a cost. It also comes with a visual impact. 
from the uh, from the uh, sort of gantries and everything that you need. Um, but there are advantages to it in terms of journey time, in terms of the uh, carbon impact and, and those sort of things. However, you know, battery technology is developing and it may be that we could have a hybrid version of uh, you know, the railway where you have some overhead line electrification, but the batteries run on, the, the trains run on batteries at other points in time. So uh, we don't think it's right yet to completely fix on precisely the traction option. And that's why we are doing the work, looking at the uh, technology options, looking at how technology is going to change between now and 2028 and 2030 as these services start to come into full use. Um, and we'll be setting out more about our position as that you know, work with government matures you know, in the you know, in the months and years ahead. So it's definitely not that electrification is off the table, but it's that we are we're looking at what the right solution is. Thanks, Will. Um, John, are you able to step in and? Yeah, Alison. So okay. thanks, Alison. So just just to answer the question about journey times. The indicative journey times that we're working on at the moment would be Bedford to Oxford would be around about 60 minutes, uh, Bedford to Cambridge around about 35 to 40 minutes with an overall journey time, uh, Oxford to Cambridge somewhere in the region of 90 to 95 minutes. Thanks John. Um, there's been a question as to um, why the current four track can't take the um, new East West Rail services. Um, Paula John, can you answer that? I can certainly start with it, okay. John may, may be able to um, give some extra details. So the existing four track railway is declared a congested line and uh, the electrification scheme that Network Rail have just been implementing on the slow lines is because they, there will be increased usage of the slow lines going forward. Um, and it is for that reason the operational analysis that we have conducted has shown that we would need to add an additional two tracks to the railway. It, sh it should be highlighted that if we could find a possibility of making this work on four tracks, we would have absolutely have gone for that. Um, there are other considerations as to why the six track railway uh, is uh, is the, the solution that works. Um, with trains operating between Oxford and Cambridge and crossing every major north south line along the route to be able to make the east west rail timetable work you need to be able to deconflict as much as you possibly can for the reason that the white spaces i.e. the available time within the existing uh, railway operations on those north south lines would not line up all the way across the route and so it would be very difficult to have a, a timetable that works from Oxford to Cambridge. It would also mean that um, if there were problems on other lines uh, we would then be in a position where we could spread those problems across further north south lines as our services would be severely impacted. Um, so it is a congested line and for the reasons I've just explained that's why the six track solution uh, was the solution that that worked. Thanks Paul. John do you want to add to that? I was only going to say that, that Paul talked about congested infrastructure. It, it is a it is a specific term that's used um, and basically means that the infrastructure from from a train capacity perspective is full and therefore the industry will not allow any further trains to be planned over that infrastructure. Um, therefore, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that capacity is really, really difficult to find along that route. Uh, and as Paul outlined, that's that's where we've ended up in respect of the four track versus six track option. OK, thank you. Um, a couple of questions um, on the impact on housing in the area. Um, 
why were the significant issues around property acquisitions not included in earlier public discussions and also there's some concerns around the uncertainty of the route causing um, house price decreases um, and how how will this be dealt with over the next one to five years? Um, Jan, would you be able to answer those? Yeah, I'll be able to touch on some of those points. Thank you. Um, so um, in terms of uh, what kind of compensation will be available to landowners, um, I encourage them to, to get onto the website and um, there's a leaflet there which um, discusses um, part one comp compensate co part one compensation, um, which which talks about um, what landowners would be entitled to um, should should um, property values be affected. Um, the need to sell scheme, um, I believe I saw some questions about when that would be eligible. Um, if that was to be adopted, um, that would be introduced at the point of um, statutory consultation, which is like to be, likely to be um, later this year or early next year. Um, and for properties affected by these, it's not um, within a, a fixed distance um, or, 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 or sorry, a fixed area or a set distance from the railway. Um, and really I'd advise people to kind of get in contact with us um, and discuss their circumstances um, and, and feedback their thoughts on the um, discretionary purchase schemes um, being consulted on. Thanks, Jan. In relation to that, um, there's been a question on proposed demolitions in Ashburn and Road in the Poets area and um, why are they deemed necessary? Um, it's probably better off if uh, someone like John can speak a little bit more about kind of the land requirements. I mean, I don't know if that's been covered by the the, the, the kind of the, the rationale behind the six tracks. Yeah, so I mean, it it, it comes down to the to to uh, what we what we spoke about previously in respect of the available capacity along the the middle main line. Uh, and the need therefore for us to to look at six tracking. Uh, it's our intent and the, the early designs at the moment are early designs and we'll do everything we can to minimise the amount of land take we need in order to facilitate that. And as Paul said, if we can find different alternatives, then we will be happy to look at them. Um, but the modelling at the moment sort of demonstrates that actually the capacity is not available and therefore we need to create that additional capacity north from Bedford Station until we, uh, till we, till we turn off towards Cambridge. Thanks, John. Um, it's been a, um, a number of questions in relation to sort of the cost versus the benefits. Um, will someone be able to provide some information on, on um, how they've been come to at this point? Thank you. So, so if I so if 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 I set uh, this out in terms of um, you know, some of the questions I've seen in relation to the sort of the costs and benefits of um, East West Rail, um, and then in turning to the sort of specific aspects on sort of the the cost estimates, that's something that Paul will pick up. Um, you. Know, it's very clear from the uh, national infrastructure strategy and also from the National Infrastructure Commission's report that actually the economic potential um, in terms of more jobs, increased prosperity, new businesses in, in this area is, is quite considerable. Um, but at the moment, without good transport links, um, we're probably missing out on in the region of 100 billion pounds of GVA, so gross value add um, over the core you know, over the course of each you know, each year. That's a huge amount of value, and if we can build a railway that establishes those really important transport links, you know, that boosts productivity, that enables new homes and communities uh, to, to to grow, that provides that better connectivity, so people can get from home to work, to see their friends and family, um, made available for tourism, connecting the sort of 
tech and life science hubs, all of those things help them a lot that additional value. And that and that's why the investment in something like East West Rail, whilst it is not an insignificant amount of money by any stretch of the imagination, and Paul will talk about those costs in a in, in, in a little bit, um, there is you know, some very clear benefits associated with delivering on those things. Um, now, I recognise that with a COVID, um, you know, that might for some people, you know, and I can see in the question, uh, in the questions that have been asked, um, sort of raise some questions about what the future is going to be like in that respect. You know, that is something that we are, of course, continuing to look at and understand and the Department for Transport is developing sort of consistent ways to look at the impact of COVID across the country and as you wouldn't be surprised modeling a number of different scenarios uh, because um you know that really you know that you, know, you right now i don't think anybody can could say in a year's time precisely what this is going to be like and that's why we will go through a number of business case stages where we have to you know, make the case to government for why investing in east west rail is the right thing to do and we'll do that at next year and then we'll do that again before construction starts so government will continue to test whether this is you know, represents really good value for money but you know our contention is you know based upon you know the great economic potential um, in this area and also because of the you know benefits to you know, people who want to travel in the area um that will that will that will make that case um, I don't know, Paul, whether you want to say anything um, sort of specific on, on on how we've been building up our costs. Yes, so um, cost cost build ups have been uh, completed uh, at several stages of the project so far with the the latest costs that were submitted for or produced for all areas of the railway. Were, were published in the route option selection report back in January of last year. And there was a difference between the costs there and the consultation. And, and we have put some documentation out on the website to show where the differences have occurred. But fundamentally, uh, the costs that were put together were based on a reasonable worst case scenario where we're ensuring that um, we had taken into account things like flood areas and we hadn't been over optimistic um, about uh, how the railway could run when we're at such an early stage of the project with uh, limited information at that stage on, on various bits and pieces like geotech. So we, we have been doing some further cost work and you will find some, um, some of the costs between the Bedford or just north of Bedford to the Hawkston area. Um, uh, in section D of the technical report that's been submitted for this consultation and the next full update of cost will come through uh, at the preferred alignment announcement uh, in which we would have conducted even further economic analysis and understand the how the, the capex costs the capital construction costs will be impacting the economic cases and the benefits so Overall, the costs are um, in line with the route option selection report. Section D have the costs have the costs shown in there because that's the area of great um, number of options which we can choose from, and therefore it's an important differentiating factor. For other areas of the scheme, the costs are not shown at that point because uh, there is further work to do, and the optionality doesn't exist and therefore it is not a, dis a differentiating factor. Um, full update will be at the next stage. Thanks, Paul. Um, there's been a number of questions on why um, not able to use Bedford South Station and also why is Bedford St John Station being retained given its proximity to Bedford Midland and its low usage? John, would you be able to pick up that one? Yeah, so so Bedford Bedford St John's is um, it's obviously fairly close um, to Bedford Midland, but 
uh, it forms part of our plans in both scenarios for the Marston Vale line. Um, we do need to relocate the station anyway, um, but we do believe that it's important from a connectivity perspective because of the, the area around Bedford St John station and ensuring that we, we maximise that usage in that area. So if you have know, people have got thoughts and ideas around whether or not Bedford St John's is, is the right thing to do or to continue to do, then by all means uh, feed that back via the consultation. We'd be interested to understand those local views as to whether or not retaining a station in that area is important for the community. Um, so yeah, please feed that back to us uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I think we're running out of time on questions now. I'm just going to pass over to Claire, who's going to um, run through a few more steps on the consultation. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alison, and thank you very much for all your questions. Um, next slide, please. So we ask you to go and read all the information, come back to us for your questions. We will respond to you and we would like you to respond to this consultation. It's really, really important to get your feedback. So feedback forms can be submitted online by emailing us at consultation at eastwestrail.co.uk or you can send them to us at free post East West Rail. For further information, or to re request a paper copy of the form to be sent to you, please email us at contact at eastwestrail.co.uk or by calling us on 0330134 Next slide, please. So what's next? Well, um, we have talked about all the different um, events that you can come to. We, we encourage you to visit the consultation room. There's lots and lots of information on the website about all the different options. We encourage you to come back to us with your questions. And more than anything, we would like you to respond to the consultation. So it's running for 10 weeks. The end day is June the 9th. So please get your response to us by then. And there were just a couple of questions which um, I saw about the digital map. We will pick up that feedback and see if we can get better maps. And also someone else asked if we can issue the slides. We don't plan to issue these slides, but we have recorded the session and we'll upload the recording onto our website. So you'll be able to see the slides in the recording. And just one last thing, if you are waiting for your copy of the summary document, or if you've ordered hard copy documents off the website and they haven't come back to you yet, please email us at contact at eastwestrail.co.uk and chase us up. Um, thank you very, very much indeed. And it just leaves me to say thank you very, very much for attending today. And um, we very much look forward to hearing from you and we hope to see you at the next Bedford webinar. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Goodbye.